In this video, we're going to look at how lone pairs affect three-dimensional geometry and our Vesper theory predictions for the three-dimensional geometry. So in the previous video, we introduced Vesper theory and all the examples that we looked at were examples where the central atom had no uh, lone pairs around it. All of its attachments were actual bonded atoms. So what happens when we actually have lone pairs uh, attached to the central atom? So the key thing to understand here is that even though we draw these lone pairs as two little seemingly insignificant dots around an atom, electrons in reality take up a large amount of three-dimensional space. So we're going to have to account for them, um, even though we draw them in these you know, small, inconspicuously seeming dots, um, we have to actually account for them in three-dimensional space because they actually take up a large amount of three-dimensional space. So what I've shown here is a table of geometries uh, given Vesper theory predictions. And on the left hand side of this table, you have the steric number. So this is just going to be the total steric number for your for your molecule around your central atom. And this um, there's this row at the top is basically your basic geometries and how many lone pairs uh, you have in your structure. So you can see in this first column, right, if we have no lone pairs, then we get the same structures that I introduced in the previous lecture, linear, trigonal, planar, tetrahedral, trigonal, bipyramidal, and octahedral. Now, when you have lone pairs, this is actually going to affect the geometry once you get up to a steric number of three or beyond, right? So let's take a trigonal planar geometry, for example, right? If you have a steric number of three and they're all real atom attachments, then you get a trigonal planar geometry. If one of those real atom attachments is a lone pair, what's going to happen is that lone pair is going to take up space and then you're going to have a bent structure for your geometry. So instead of that bonded atom, you're going to have the lone pairs that are going to be taking up space and pushing those bonds down to a 120 degree angle, right? Same thing here with all of these different steric numbers. You can see that once you add the lone pair, you're going to, um, you're going to basically bend those bonds down, right? Um, so that's the basic effect that lone pairs have in three-dimensional geometry is they take up their own space like a bonded atom would, and they affect the geometry in that way. So let's look at an, a concrete example of this. Let's look at the uh, NO2 ion. So NO2 minus ion. Right. So the Lewis structure for NO2 it, uh, has the following uh, representation. Right. So you're going to have these two oxygens attached. One of the oxygens is going to be double bonded. Going to have two uh, lone pairs here three lone pairs around that oxygen, and then you're gonna have a final lone pair that will be located on the central nitrogen, right? And all of that is fully negatively charged, right? Um, now, obviously this one has some resonance, right? So you can equally represent this NO2 ion in the following way. Right. So um, so these would be rough. These would be equivalent. This shows resonance in this structure. And um, and so, you know, you can represent it as either or, but it actually won't affect our prediction of the three dimensional geometry. Since remember, in a steric number calculation, we're looking at bonded atoms, not necessarily looking at whether it's a single, double or triple bond. If it's one bonded atom, it's just one bonded atom. Right. So so with this, we want to calculate the steric number. So let's calculate our steric number here. Calculate the steric number SN. Right. So the steric number, again, is the sum of the number of bonded atoms and the number of lone pairs around the central atom. So implicit in that is that we first have to identify what is the central atom. In this case, it's super easy. Our central atom is here with this central nitrogen. Right. This is our central atom. So we've identified the central atom and now we just have to investigate how many bonded atoms are around it and how many lone pairs are around it. Well, for this central nitrogen, we have two bonded atoms, one oxygen on this side and one oxygen on the other, right? So this is two, the number of bonded atoms, 
plus one lone pair that's located at the central atom, right? So you have one lone pair that's located at this central nitrogen. So that's gonna give us a total steric number of three. So since we have a total steric number of three, we know that our base geometry is gonna be trigonal planar. However, one of those is going to be a lone pair, right? So that means we're going to end up with a bent geometry. So we call this bent when you have a lone pair at the top and the two real bonds at the bottom, right? So that means the Vesper theory shape is bent, right? So basically to draw that, right? I'm gonna draw the lone pair in like a lobe. So we just show that it, you know, takes up some real space here, right? So this is gonna be my lone pair. And then we'll have one oxygen down here with its lone pairs. And then one oxygen down here with its lone pairs, right? This will be a 120 degree angle. Right, so that lone pair basically takes the place of a bonded atom in this case, right? But we would end up with a bent geometry for NO2 minus, right? So that's how a lone pair would kind of change things here, right? So you would basically use a table like this. So I, I suggest that you either, you know, find this exact table somewhere on the internet. If you just Google Vesper theory table, this table should come up or there's a couple of others, whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Um, use it when you're doing practice problems, when you're doing homework, these will help you get comfortable with identifying three dimensional structure based off of Vesper theory. Okay. Let's, let's go through another example here. So the next example I want to look at is ICL five. So let's look at ICL five molecule. Okay, so ICL5 molecule, let's think about its Lewis structure. So envision how many valence electrons do we have here, right? So we know that iodine is going to have seven valence electrons, right? So that's coming from the iodine. Plus chlorine also has seven valence electrons. Remember they're in the same column of the periodic table. So you got seven times five, that accounts for our five chlorines, our Cl5. So that means we're gonna have a total of 42 valence electrons, right? So in this case, iodine is gonna be our central atom, right? So we're gonna put the iodine there, and then we're gonna bond these five chlorines. Now keep in mind when you're um, forming these Lewis structures, you don't have to think about the uh, three-dimensional representation. The, for a valid Lewis structure, you don't have to have the correct um, three-dimensional representation. You're just bonding the atoms and getting the lone pairs and the bonding pattern right, right? So you don't have to worry about um, specifically the three-dimensional geometry when doing Lewis structures, right? Okay, so uh, we've accounted for 10 electrons, right, at this point. Um, keep in mind that iodine is below the third period, so it's perfectly comfortable accommodating this expanded octet, just like we looked at in the previous unit. So we're gonna go ahead and fill in our lone pairs here for our chlorines. Filling these guys in. Right, and so if we think about how many electrons we've accounted for at this point, right, we got, you know, eight times five, which is 40, right? So we've accounted for 40 valence electrons. That means we have two more valence electrons that we need to account for, right? Um, all these chlorines already have their octet satisfied. This iodine in the center is already accommodating an expanded octet. So what we can do is add that lone pair to the iodine. Right, so now we have a central atom that contains a lone pair, right? Let's get to calculating the steric number. So let's calculate the steric number. So our steric number, we know we're gonna have five bonded atoms here. We got five bonds to chlorine. So we got five plus a lone pair. So that's gonna give us a total steric number of six, but we have one lone pair, right? So let's look back at our chart. So we got a steric number of five, right? With a, um, with 
one lone pair here, right? So this gives us a uh, C, what is known as a seesaw geometry here, right? So for, oh, wait, 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 no, let me go back. Steric number of six. Yeah, so we got a steric number of six with one lone pair. So we're gonna have square pyramidal, right? We're gonna have a square pyramidal geometry here. Full steric number of six, one lone pair is a square pyramid. So we're gonna go back to that slide and go ahead and draw this guy out in three dimensions, right? So for a square pyramid, we're gonna have one bond in the plane and we're gonna have one lone pair here in the plane taking up some space and our chlorine bonds are gonna be going in and out of the board, the rest of the chlorine bonds. So I'm gonna use dashes and wedges to represent those. And so that's gonna be our square pyramid. So Vesper theory predicts a square pyramid geometry for ICL5, right? Okay, so basically what you need to know from this, um, two big takeaways is that electrons, electron pairs, lone pairs, take up real space. So they have to be accounted for in a three-dimensional geometry. If you know this chart, have this chart readily available for you for yourself, then you'll be able to know how the structure is going to accommodate that lone pair because it's still going to be involved in the repulsion. So it's still going to have to be accounted for in the three-dimensional structure, right? So electrons take up real space and Vesper theory accounts for that. And you can look at these types of tables in order to figure out how the shape is going to accommodate that number of lone pairs.